Well, hello and welcome to another edition of Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham, where Team Needham discusses everything healthcare. I am your host, Sean Needham, and I am streaming live from Rexburg, Idaho, beautiful Rexburg, Idaho. Spring, it looks like it's right around the corner. Um, I'm super excited for spring, although it's not like uh, I don't like seasons. I definitely like seasons. So um, you don't want to miss out on today's show. We have a very special guest back. Super excited to have him on. Um, Rob Wolf, he's a renowned author, biochemist, uh, talking about diet, and and um, he has been doing that for years, uh, wrote a book, Wired to Eat, and his most recent project was called Sacred Cow, and he was recently featured with, um, I guess, the co-author of Sacred Cow, which is in a book and a movie um, with Diane Rogers. Is that correct, Rob? That's correct, yeah. Yeah, so um, we're going to start by by discussing um the Joe Rogan podcast and and how that went because it's a really really cool information and I suggest you listen to that podcast. I know the Joe Rogan podcast is long; it's three hours. But I will tell you, when you talk to people like Rob Wolf with incredible amounts of information, three hours goes really really fast. So um, you don't want to miss out on that podcast. And and Rob, I'm going to go ahead and give it to you. Um, tell us a little bit about the podcast. Mm. It is long, but it goes by rather quickly when you're in the hot seat. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the book and film tried to unpack the, um, the health environmental and ethical considerations of a animal inclusive food system. And, um, that's a lot. I mean, it's a lot to even say, to attempt to say in an elevator pitch. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's funny because on the one hand we'll, we'll hear people say, oh, you know, uh, attention spans are shorter now than what they are with goldfish and different things like that. And I, I think that there's some truth to that, but clearly the, the long format, um, you know, podcast and, and, uh, internet show is clearly, uh, intriguing to people like Joe Rogan's show is the largest media presence on the planet currently. Right. So, uh, uh, clearly there's, it, there's not, it's not entirely truthful to say that, that people have, you know, uh, uh, horribly short attention spans and that people can't dig into, uh, uh, nuance and detail. Clearly they can. I think that, um, actually what we're butting up against is that, uh, when the standard media handles something, it's handled in such a, a just piss poor way that you really can't handle more than 13 seconds of it before you kind of get sick of it and, and right. you 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 want to um you know escape from it and i i think it's because it, it just has a, a feel of um it's not authentic it, it's not real and i'm not even gonna you, you know truth or not truth is is tough to to ferret out like these are really complex topics and so much of what what joe has been digging into are you know whether it's covid or or what have you are really complex topics and you can't do um justice to these things in soundbite treatment which is kind of all that we really get out of the the mainstream i i ironically you know um who's doing a three-hour long format show talking about you know, let, let's just say COVID as an example, because folks will will say uh, w one of the the feedback from us appearing on on the Joe Rogan experience has generally been very good. There are some people that are very cranky about it because of some of the the stuff that's popped up around uh, Joe in some of his his earlier comments and whatnot. And I I personally think that that was a purely a hatchet job uh, against him because Thank he's you. he's provided a a platform for people to talk about things like COVID and do it in a long format. But uh, MSNBC, CNN, none of these outlets are providing three hours of, of back and forth debate on any of these topics. You know, there's uh, there's your canned, here's here's what you're going to believe, here's here's what is the, the signed off upon um, material. And what's really fascinating to me is, uh, uh, particularly from the world that I come from, this kind of ancestral health space, um, people are pretty certain that we're not being given the real deal on say like food, you know, they'll talk about Ansel keys and sugar and, and all this stuff. And there's all these, uh, uh you know, grand, uh, kind of conspiracy theories around that, that, that folks kind of buy into, and there's lots of data to support it. But then, you know, you run into things like the, the COVID topic or, or this climate change stuff and, you know, like how climate change, it might be affected by animal husbandry, 
and they're just like, well, yeah, clearly the the media narrative is is the whole story and nothing but the story, and to question it is is paramount to like treason, you know, unto yeah. humanity, and um, maybe that's true, or maybe that's complete bollocks, and uh, so I, I, you know, I know I'm just kind of casting around here a little bit, but the it, it was a it was a cool experience. Uh, Joe is a very smart guy, and he's very curious. I think one of the reasons why he um, Joe definitely has his his leanings in what he finds to be truthful and not truthful and everything. Like he's he's kind of settled more or less on this kind of carnivore ish diet, and he he kind of goes on and off of it. But he's like, I feel great with it. My energy is good, and like his inflammation is is much improved on on something like that. So that's kind of interesting. But but he's also willing to ask a lot of thorny questions around like, well, can't a vegan diet support certain people? And uh, and I think that that's kind of unique and and special in the world. And I, I think that that is supported by the fact that he's got the largest media presence on the planet currently. And yeah, I, that, that's what I've got on that, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, I admire him because I think when you watch his podcasts on any subject and, you know, obviously he has a wide range of, of guests and subject matter on, you can tell that he is inquiring to learn more. I mean, he's right. really, you know, he's interviewing the guests, not just for his listeners and viewers, but for himself to learn. Right. Right. And that becomes pretty obvious, I think. So, so tell me a little bit about, about the details of that interview with, uh, um, you know, how it, how it, you know, just sum it up in about five minutes about the, the details of the interview uh, regarding your, um, your book, Sacred Cow and the movie. Yeah. I mean, we, um, it, one of the cool things about Joe is he's very random access. Like he'll, he'll come at things from a lot of different directions. One of the challenges being interviewed by him is the random access, you know, particularly <laughs> when, when, um, you know, again, like the book and film cover the, the health environmental and ethical considerations of an animal inclusive food system. And so part of the cool thing about the book is that we're able to start from some first principles and then move forward and like chapter one feeds into chapter two in, into chapter three. And you build, build this case and build this background, build people's understanding of kind of the way that we're, we're seeing the world. And if you're just kind of dropping in at different points in that, which is a little bit, you know, the, the way that the interview went, it can be a little bit disjointed relative to like mm -hmm. taking in the, the book, the, the film presents that same material, but, um, not in as as succinct and kind of scientific fashion. It's a little bit more emotion driven versus the the more kind of kind of fact driven. But I mean, that was largely we we just kept playing with different elements of like, well, what are some concerns around health, and what are some claims around like the animal husbandry side? Like, do do cows really consume all this water? Like, are cows pe people in the both the media and and Mainstream media and social media will present things like uh, this cartoonish picture that the decreasing water levels in the Colorado River is caused by cows just wow. sticking straws in the river and just like drinking it dry. And this is absolute. It's preposterous. Right. Um, 94 to 97 percent of the water that's used in uh, cattle production is water that falls on the earth it, it, it's yeah. rain and snow and 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 uh there's no way that we would use that water differently you know i mean it it, it is the water that that nourishes the the planet as as it were whereas uh, and joe was very uh savvy to this he's like by contrast um almonds are raised almost exclusively from pumping water out of the ground and it, it it's uh in areas of california that oftentimes the almond growers get first rights to the water in in areas where the the communities around the almond growers have to have water trucked in for drinking because the almond growers basically have a, a monopoly on the the groundwater and they're pumping the groundwater out 70 80 percent of that those almonds are shipped overseas mainly to china so in one of the most productive areas of the planet for agriculture we're mining our water to send it overseas to China in the form of almonds, but cows are the the evil part of the food system, not yeah. this like plant based, you know. What? And I have no problem with almonds, but it's, uh, let's just be honest about, you know, if you're going to cry foul about draining aquifers and whatnot, cows are not the place to do that. And uh, 
so that's an example. And then, you know, on the, the we never really got super deep into the ethical side. And uh, the, the I guess the um, we made the case and this was kind of an interesting process of writing the book was realizing that. Um, assuming that what, what Diana and I are saying is true like or accurate, I don't want to say true, mm -hmm. but it, let's say it's accurate. When we really looked at the data on this stuff, it seems really quite difficult to raise a human absent animal products and have that work out well. Like pregnant, you know, you have a, a, a woman, she gets pregnant, uh, uh, starts raising a baby in, in utero, the baby is born, then you, you know, you breastfeed and you, you know, go forward. If there's no animal products in any of that story, it's really difficult to have that work properly. And yeah. usually the, the, uh, both the mom and the child are deficient in a number of nutrients. If the, if the developing baby is deficient in omega threes in zinc and iron to, to just name a few things, B vitamins, they suffer ir irreparable harm. The uh, neurological development, uh, uh, different type uh, developmental stages are never met and will never be met later. And so that child will be, uh, to some degree incapacitated throughout their whole life. And if that is accurate, which I think is very, very defensible that it is accurate, then it really changes the discussion around the ethics of the inclusion of animals in a food system. Um, I, I am in this kind of weird spot. Like I'm, I'm not really religious. I, I call myself like, uh, 99% atheist and 1% agnostic because I, I, I really don't know. And, uh, mm -hmm. the, the Richard Dawkins esque atheists are as annoying to me as like, uh, super over the, the he's over the top religious about atheism. Yeah, that's really kind of, right. Right. Yeah, it, it, I agree. Yeah. It's stunning. Um, <laughs> but that said, I, you know, I, I really do value human life above other life on the planet. Now that doesn't mean that I think that we should go out and totally fuck up all of the world and all of our ecosystems and create a right. world in which humans can't live. That's not what I'm saying, but when it comes right down to it, I, I, I look out into the, you know, the night sky and we seem to be it. We are the only, we seem to be the only type of intelligent life like what we've got and right or wrong, I put a disproportionate value on that, you know, and, and when we look at the history of planet earth, there's been lots and lots and lots of different types of life. And there doesn't appear to have ever been a type of life like human intelligence. Right. And I just put a premium on that. And so if we need to feed ourselves in a particular way to optimize what is human life, then I'm, I'm down for that. And again, within the constraints of if we damage and destroy, like it, it's awesome what Elon Musk is, you know, talking about like going and terraforming Mars and all that stuff. But, um, that's a highly risky, unlikely to succeed and very small, you know, success proposition, go be achieved, like do that. But if we just didn't break the planet that we're on right now, we've probably got another like three to 5 billion years of being able to to live on this thing before we would have to leave before the plant, you, you know, the sun expands and consumes the earth. And we, right. we, we've got to shuffle to another neighborhood or, or ultimately be gone. And so, um, I really put a high premium on, on the value of human life. And that changes the, um, the ethical considerations about how we need, how we should feed ourselves, but it needs to be done in a way that we could come back 5,000 years from now and our, topsoil is better than it is today. Our atmosphere is better than it is today. Our waterways are better and healthier than it is today. And humans are better and healthier than they are today. And so this is the thing that I'm trying to, to balance within this ethical consideration is that via enlightened self-interest, we really should have a very healthy planet to raise ourselves and our children and their children. And also for the you know, the co-inhabitants of this planet. And again, to circle back to, you know, the original thing that takes a long time to, to unpack all of those positions. Like if you try to throw out a few sound bites, if I throw out a sound bite of, I value human life above all other life on the planet, th there's a lot of interpretation that can be had there. That's probably not going to remotely represent what my intent was on that. Right. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's all about really what you're talking about is about sustainability 
Um, yep. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm with you on the um, I don't believe that you can really truly be healthy long term. And especially if you're, you know, um, raising a young a young child, I think you need because you're putting so many calories on when you're growing, when you're that young, um, that you you need animal products because they are more caloric dense. Um, and, and like you say, there's, there's nutrients, whether it be iron or whether it be B vitamins that you can't get out of plants, um, or right. not, not in the same way. Um, but also, you know, I, I, I live in an agriculture community. So I, 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 and I drive a lot and I drive by a field, you know, let's say it's a 125 acre quarter section field. And, you know, I, I, it's watered usually by, uh, it's irrigated usually by a circle, um, a pivot irrigation and, Sometimes in the in the off season, they'll have cows in a field, like if it's been like and it's just pasture or something mm -hmm. sometimes. And I think, you know, so here's this field that's a quarter of a section, you know, 125 acres. And, you know, there's a I don't know honestly the number, but there's like a hundred a hundred cows on the that that's that's being fed off this just this grass. Okay. And I think about that same field if you put potatoes on it. And how much energy, fertilizer, water it takes to grow that field of potatoes. And I'm not, I'm not against potatoes at all. But when you look at, I'm just guessing, I haven't done the math, but I am just guessing when you look at it nutrient wise and calorie wise, there's a lot more nutrients and calories in a hundred head of cattle than there are in a hundred acres of potatoes. I mean, is, is that true? I mean, that would be a good Diana Rogers question. Like she was better at, at some of those, um, conversions, but it, it's, uh, uh, it, it is. So I know like corn ends up becoming very challenging because corn is so, um, resource intensive. And like, yeah. we have this, this war occurring it between Russia and Ukraine and Ukraine is one of these, um, it produces a remarkable amount of wheat. It also is this uh, major exporter of uh, fertilizer, like this this uh, phosphorus fertilizer. And so we are going to see some. We already see supply chain issues and and significant problems. But over the next year, we're going to see a uh, a real hammering of things like corn production because fertilizer prices are, are going to really go through the roof. And then it, as it is right now, like the, the folks that I've talked to that are in the ag scene, a lot of people who traditionally raise corn or grow corn, they're going to uh, plant soybeans instead because they're much less uh, fertilizer intensive. So we're going to mm -hmm. have this massive glut of soybeans. We're going to have a, a shortage of corn. And then just to, to throw, just as an aside, we had this huge volcanic eruption right at the beginning of the year. There's some people that are predicting that we're going to have some type of a, a volcanic winter this time next year due to the effects there. So you're going to have a particularly cold winter, super crappy harvest, very, very expensive uh, inputs. And I'll tell you who is going to be minimally impacted by that. Pasture-based um, ranchers. Right. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah. at, back in, in 2008, uh, during the, the financial, the, that financial implosion, Gas prices spiked. I, people don't remember, but oil went to $150 a barrel and it became prohibitively expensive to, to raise uh, cattle in the conventional kind of, kind of methodology because feed went, went super expensive. Like they started just culling animals and like plowing them into fields because it was too expensive to raise them. And we have all these log jams in, in uh, uh, processing and the people were, and there was a, a drought. So like there were, there was water shortages and whatnot. So you couldn't raise the the grains for the, for the kind of conventional feed, but the pasture based farmers or ranchers were completely unaffected by this stuff other than they, they were able to charge a premium for their, their food because, right. you know, they, they had the availability there. So again, like if you ever get Diana on the show, she's much better off the cuff with like, Oh, it take you know, this many cows on this much land. Uh, the, the one thing that's interesting though, about, cattle and things like bison and, and just ruminants in general though is that they are raised on land that you cannot use for farming this is a really critical piece that folks yeah. don't get um the the areas that we that we raise cattle on by by and large uh, uh, are places that you can't 
can't farm. It, it's, you know, slope hillsides and rocky terrain and, and stuff like that. So it's, it's areas that are either going to lay fallow, which isn't really a good idea, or that, uh, you know, we, we use in a, a smart, holistic way so that we re-nutrify the soil and, and improve its, its characteristics and get some food out of the process too. So the, the comparison of like, you know, we should probably grow potatoes where it makes sense to grow potatoes, use some, some type of ruminant animal to clean up those areas after potato production and wheat production and corn production. And then there's these huge tracts of land that you can't grow potatoes or you can't grow anything other than perennial grasses in these areas. And they're the huge, you know, grasslands that, that typically, uh, uh, you know, characterize the, the central features of the, you know, most, most of the big continents. And that's where you should have ruminant animals and try to optimize their situation there so that they improve water capture and soil health and carbon sequestration and all those types of things and food production. Well, and, and it's amazing process that's been created, um, how, you know, animals, you know, eat plants, um, you know, plants give off oxygen, the plants, the animals will, you know, obviously use the uh, oxygen and um, plants, you know, they, they need nitrogenous waste. And so when, you know, for fertilizer, which, right. you know, so when you have cows on, you know, any kind of cows or sheep or whatever, when they're grazing on any kind of ground, they're putting fertilizer back into the ground. And it's, it's just, it's created wonderfully. Um, and, and it works if we just, uh, you know, if we, if we let that happen, I think that that's why I'm a big believer that I think that, you know, and not that I'm against carnivore. Um, I'm against, I, I'm, I'm a little bit leery of being strict vegan just because I just don't, I think it's very difficult to get enough nutrients. And I get it when people compare it. They're like, well, I went, when I went vegan, I, I lost weight. It's like, well, yeah, if you were eating the standard American diet, of course you did. <laughs> right. But um, long term, I just don't know how sustainable it is, especially for somebody that's growing. Um, but I, I really believe that we're omnivores. So I really do believe that, you know, we're meant to mit, eat, you know, a mixture of, but when we have animals, I think um, we should probably gravitate towards that. And I get it in the standard American diet. You know, one of our problems is, is that we just have overabundance, you know, that, right. that, that's, that's the problem is that we have freezers full of them. We have pantries full of stuff and we have just an overabundance of food. So that's part of, of the issue, um, you know, when, when we're able to overeat, is it that we can just store all that stuff when we used to not be able to. Right, right, absolutely. So, Rob, let's kick in. Um, thank you for that. That's wonderful. And just congratulations on your book. And I would love to have Diana on our show and just um, interview her on, yeah, just some of the questions that I do have about, you know, uh, about the details of, you know, calorie dense food versus animal versus plant. Um, cause to me, it just, uh, it, um, I'd like to know the science behind it. I, I, you know, cause I haven't really been able to in my head really figure it out. So yeah, she's yeah. really, uh, she's gone deep on that, you know, like, you know, there are these claims about like this much broccoli is equivalent to this much beef. And uh, at a superficial level, I know that that's false, but like Diana really, she, she, cites the studies off the top of her head and you know like cool. that's part of, that's the part of the book that she wrote so that, that you know, she's much much better at that than i cool. am yeah yeah well let's dive into circadian rhythm and this is actually very related to what we're talking about because if we want if we want to kind of make things sustainable um including our own lives with health um circadian rhythm is very important and I talk about it all the time on our podcast or our short videos, just when I'm educating patients and, and, and our listeners and viewers is that, you know, we are diurnal creatures, um, which means we're meant to be awake and be productive during the day and sleep at night. And, and I always, you know, when I have somebody that has health problems and they're, they're a night, they're a night worker or they're a shift worker, whether they're firefighters, whether they're police or whether they're nurses, um, and they're having health issues. I mean, I'll tell them it's, and you know, kudos goes out to those people. Um, cause we do need them. There's no doubt. Right. Um, but I'll tell them, I'm like, you know, you, in order to really get your health on track, you've got to change your schedule. We're meant to work during the day and we're meant to, um, sleep at night. Sleep now, at night. Yeah. yeah. And I think on our last, when you were on last time, I think we talked a little bit about those night shift workers and what happens when they eat at night. And, 
you know, I, I think typically, you know, and I'll even preach this somewhat is that, you know, if you're in, in, if you're in, um, in it to lose weight, it's in a simplistic form. And I know I'm going to get some haters that are going to go against this, but it's calories in calories out. I mean, in, in, in some ways, um, but you're kind of telling me that if you're eating at the wrong times, it might be more to it than that. Correct. Well, I mean, it, it, uh, man, there's a, again, a lot to unpack with that. What we find is that shift workers just tend to eat more in general. Um, they, they certainly tend to, uh, shift workers and, and I'm going to lump all this stuff together, shift work and also people who are short slept, which is almost everybody. Um, right. uh, they tend to eat more. They tend to eat at kind of metabolically poor times, like tend to eat closer to bedtime versus eating more of the calories earlier in the day. Um, our, our decision fatigue throughout the day gets, gets whittled away. And, and, uh, when we are sleep deprived, our, our, uh, our ability to have self-control is just destroyed. It's just nuked. I, I, I don't know the exact numbers. My good friend, Dr. Kirk Parsley is a retired Navy SEAL and he became a physician. And then he ran the West Coast SEAL teams for eight years. And he became a sleep expert, basically looking at this population of high achieving people who are chronically sleep deprived and watching the wheels fall off the wagon again and again and again. He called it the SEAL flu. What would happen to these guys? You know, just, just very predictable um, problems that would arise. But uh, at the end of the day, it is indeed calories in, calories out. But if I have an appetite signal that is like three times stronger because I'm sleep deprived than normal, uh, it, you know, it, it's going to be very difficult to win that. You know, right. I mean, it, it, it's kind of like if I'm, if I'm wanting to run a race and my friend has no headwind and I have a five mile an hour headwind, like I, I th this is a real disadvantage that I'm, I'm going to experience. So, um, and this is where, like, I, I think so much of the, the online world just kind of has lost its mind. Um, the calories in calories out folks will just say, you know, just eat less and move more completely ignoring the fact that like shift workers and people who are sleep deprived, they don't, they barely feel like living to say nothing of exercising and their, their ability to make good decisions is, is completely tanked. And so often folks that are in shift work, they're doing it, but oftentimes because um, you can make more money. So it's like single parents and and they've got uh, all these other, uh, you know, uh, extenuating circumstances that further worsen their stress load. You know, I, like I, I think about the, the night shift nurse is just such a classic example of this, like single mom or, or single dad, uh, you know, and they're working this thing so that they can be, you know, the kid stays with grandparents overnight and then they, they get home, grab the kid, get them off to school. They try to sleep during the day. They're able to make, you know, 50% more money in the time that they do that because they don't have dual income. You, you know, these are all the things that people are dealing with. And then people on the internet are like, well, you just need to eat less, you know? And it's like, yeah. And how do you affect that change in the, you know, the situation we're talking about? But, uh, the circadian biology topic got on my radar back, back in 2001. I I'm a big fan of a book called uh, protein power life plan by Michael and Mary Eads. Uh, they, I, I think it's still one of the best books I've ever read on, on diet and lifestyle overall. And they mentioned some circadian biology stuff in there that was really powerful, but it was right around that time that they, they mentioned on their blog, this book called lights out sleep, sugar, and survival. And it was written by a medical anthropologist and a, um, a biophysicist and they they did what what is to my mind still like this book has so stood the test of time you know 21 22 years later basically talking about our, our circadian biology and how incredibly injurious it is to not live with with the both the seasons and also the diurnal you know light dark cycles and that is maybe the reason why I've been particularly effective. Like all of my books have talked about both sleep and food and they've, they've kind of had equal billing and I've just been, you know, unremitting in, in emphasizing the importance of this stuff. And, uh, 
to the degree that people are able to get on top of circadian biology issues, they, they do much better. And then, you know, I, I've done some work with police, military, and fire circles where they're on shift work. We know that, but here are the things that we're going to do to miti mitigate the downside. We're going to have a lower carb diet. Um, we're going to try to stick more calories earlier in that person's day, whatever that means for that person. Mm -hmm. When they can sleep, we make sure that they protect their sleep practically at gunpoint, you know, like black, blacked out curtains, dark room, uh, maybe using some melatonin and whatnot to, to enhance that process when they do wake up trying to get as much full spectrum light on their person as we, we possibly can achieve, you know, within their, their kind of work or, or living environment. And it, it's really helped a lot of people. So, you know, it make, it does make sense. It's not just calories in calories out. And you talk about the decision fatigue, um, you talk about the stress already in most of those people's lives and, and, and yeah, they've already, you know, they're, they're burning the candle at both ends. So it, it makes sense too, that they're not going to make, they've already made a bunch of decisions at night when you should be sleeping already. So right. now you're awake during the day with some other stressors going on, whether it's trying to get your kids to school or, and then maybe trying to get enough sleep in. And I can tell you, I'm even guilty of that, even though I think I have a pretty good circadian rhythm schedule. Um, but my worst choices are, especially when it comes to food, are definitely at night. I mean, right, right. And, and I will tell you, Rob, it's almost within an hour of going to bed, even. It's like, oh, you know what? Just one of these or one of that. And it is, you just, you've made so many decisions throughout the day. It's hard to make a good decision again. And I know some people, I've talked about that concept before, um, and some people don't, don't believe in that, but I do believe in decision fatigue. I really do. That's why. Yeah make all your food choices or all your good health choices earlier in the day, you know, whatever your day is. <laughs> yep. Yep. And, and again, you know, we're, we're in this era where, you know, like privilege and social justice topics are, are important and, and rightfully so. And something that gets missed in that is, uh, the person or the individuals with more allostatic load, more total stress. And that stress could come from sleep, you know, deprivation, uh, you know, dodgy relationships on and on and on bad food, even. And, and this is where this thing becomes a really terrible downward spiral. Um, we don't sleep well. So then we make poor eating decisions, which further impacts negatively impacts our sleep. So the little bit of sleep that we were going to get isn't as restful. And that becomes this downward spiral. And mix into all of that stuff is this decision fatigue thing, which is, is absolutely real. And, it, you know, it, it, it's interesting because on the one hand we have like, uh, again, you know, like these Navy SEAL examples of just being hard chargers and, you know, uh, staying the course and all that. And that's great, but there is kind of a reality that anybody will break at some point. And the one thing that we know for certain, like it within, um, uh, like military interrogation circles. I have a couple of friends that are, are interviewing interrogation specialists, both for the military and for law enforcement. And most of this stuff is not kosher within law enforcement because, you know, you can't, can't do this to citizens. But if you really want somebody to talk, you don't have to hook up electrodes to their, to their ankles and shock them and stuff. You just keep them awake. Like that is literally the most guaranteed thing. Three, four days of keeping somebody continually awake and they will crack and they will tell you everything in the world that, that you want to know. And, um, uh, there's, there's no ultimately sleep deprivation will break even the toughest person. And this is part of the reason why like within seal qualification training or at buds, when people go through the process of becoming a seal, they keep them awake for five days. They want to see what all of those people break. What they want to see is what do you do when you do break and, and, you know, do you completely go bananas or, you know, do, uh, do you become really, violent or, or, you know, are you able to maintain some semblance of, of, uh, you know, control over that stuff. But at the end of the day, all those folks end up, you know, kind of having more or less like a psychotic break and, and then they have a controlled environment, but they observe what happens there and then they, they motor them through and, and the individual experiences, what it's like to be in that degree of stress and, and sleep deprivation. And then the, the folks training them get to observe that. But I, I think that 
it, it's weird. We have this kind of Puritan work ethic where it's like, oh, just work harder. You know, you got to have the hustle, you know, sleep when you're dead and all that type of stuff. And, and yeah. certainly there's moments where that, that's true. There's moments in our lives where you just got to knuckle down and, and get it done. Like the timeline is, is what the timeline is, but people turn everyday life into a constant, you know, struggle around that. And it, it, it just will wear you down to a nub and, and, it, you know, the, I, I, the, uh, centers for disease control now recognize shift work as a known carcinogen. Like they, 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 they look at it like asbestos and cigarette smoking. Wow. Like they recognize that it so alters our, our metabolism that it uh, dramatically enhances our likelihood of developing different types of cancer. It's a, it's a known carcinogen. So, you know, you got to do everything you can to kind of mitigate that process. Right. And, and I'm a big believer in, you know, there, there's really, I, 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 I say it all the time I mean, to, to our patients or to our listeners and viewers on our podcast, there are literally three things that we can do to stay healthy. And that's eat, exercise and sleep. And the most important is sleep. Yeah. We, yeah. we don't have to exercise to live. I mean, we don't, we, we, we could be very sedentary and still stay alive. We have to eat to live. So eating is probably more important than exercise. And, and we see that. I think any any athlete will understand that. You can't exercise your way out of a bad diet. That's just true. Um, and then with that being said, we will die without sleep before we'll die without food. Right. Right. And, you know, you could, like you're talking about, deprive somebody of food for three days. I mean, chances are it's not going to break them. I, I, you know, most individuals are not going to break them as long as they have water. They're, they're, they're going to be their Their life is not in danger. Um, but you, you deprive somebody of sleep for three days and yeah, see what kind of bad decisions you, they you've are. You've got a hot mess on your hands there. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And so what do we do with, what, what about people that live in Northern latitudes? Like, you know, in Fairbanks, Alaska, where is their circadian rhythm different? I mean, it's not that we haven't had people that have that have lived in those environments for thousands of years. So, you know, you're talking about the dark and the light cycle. How does that change it? It usually doesn't go well for those folks. Like I, I live at almost 50 degrees northern latitude being in Montana. And um, I am a happier, better person on that level when I was living in Texas and I was at like 28 degrees, you know, northern latitude. Mm -hmm. Um the day night cycles were not as profound one way or the other, like, right. and, and it kind of cuts both ways in the summer. It's a little bit weird too, because the sun never goes down You're, or, you know, it does, but it's like 1030 at night at the, at the apex of, of summer. And it's still light outside and like trying to put kids to bed is, yep. you know, an absolute, you know, disastrous mess. And then you start getting light in the sky at like 430 in the morning. So you've right. got this like tiny, window of dark and then right around um well the the uh, winter solstice when the the days are the shortest um it, it it's tough i mean seasonal affective disorder is one of these things where you're yeah. you're legitimately depressed um and you know it gets more and more difficult the further north you go to to deal with this where i am at least there is this window of time where even if it's cloudy or overcast if you go outside it's typically many orders of magnitude brighter outside than it is inside. And so like, if you can just get outside for particularly uh, right around the time that the sun is coming up and then right in the evening when the sun is starting to set those points, if you can be outside 15 to 30 minutes at, at those key points, seems to really help circadian biology. If you can be outside longer, it definitely seems to help. But if you get far enough North, the sun never really comes up, right. you know, and uh, I think things like seasonal affective disorder, but light boxes, the sad light boxes can help. Um, sauna is interesting. And I, I haven't looked super close at the the biology on this, but most of these far northern uh, cultures have, a, a you know, a, a history of sauna use. And I know this is completely anecdotal, but. I have noticed that if I can get into a sauna three to five days a week, 15 to 20 minutes, I didn't experience the seasonal affective disorder like I usually do. Now, right around Christmas, I was, the days were, were short, like yeah. the, the nights were long, you know, I'm full of terrors and all that stuff. Like it, it was, uh, I was not at, at my best there, but it didn't get remotely as bad as what it, it did when I lived in like Seattle, but I, I was also not as healthy then. And, and, uh, 
I, I was aggressively supplementing vitamin D now, and I wasn't then. But I, I think that there are mitigating strategies. But I, I do think that um, optimum human, you know, happiness and everything, like more modest latitudes, I, I think work well for sure. You know, it's it. it I, I think that that is. Uh, I think it's difficult to argue with that. You know, that a, a little more normalized photo period, both on the 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 day side and the night side probably leaves people in kind of an optimized state. And it, it's not super surprising if we look at where humans evolved, uh, peri-equatorial, yep. not a huge variation year to year, you know, throughout a year in the day-night cycle. I just find it fascinating that um, built into our evolutionary biology is this ability for our internal clocks to reset around northern or southern migration and getting out of that that you know that band of being right around the equator like i really find that fascinating well and i was just going to mention that i mean and when you think about not just humans well i mean there's a reason that we might have gravitated towards that area but think about how other animals are very much more abundant um, around the equator and plants. I mean, plants are much more abundant. So animals can eat the plants, you know, animals that we eat, you know, herding animals can eat the plants and then we eat the animals and we can eat the plants too. But if you look in those around the equator, you basically have a food source 365 days a year. Whereas if you live in Fairbanks, Alaska, if you don't have some way to store food, I mean, you're going to die in the winter. There's just no doubt about it. Right. Right. Or you keep hunting. You have to hunt. Well, yeah, food I mean, is so there, hunting. There yeah. are animals yeah. out there that you could hunt. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Which I, so, I think is um, kind of the classic Inuit, you know, uh, life way, uh, very pr fairly minimalized um, uh, plant consumption right. and then huge reliance on, on things like seal and polar bear and, and uh, I think some elk and caribou and stuff like that. But seal for sure, you know, being this, this major, um, you know, kind of backbone of their, their dietary, you know, needs throughout the year. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, um, do you think that when we migrated up to those areas, do, do you see, do you see a, a population that when they come back down, does it, does it, you know, like the Intuit people, I mean, do, does, do they live better down at lower latitudes, um, later on? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm 10% Native American. It looks like probably Chickasaw. And then other than that, I'm like nor Northern European, you know, like Scottish, yeah. Irish, uh, Swedish, German. Um, and man, I got to tell you, if uh, my optimized area is high desert near the, the equator, like Baja, California, kind of in the mountains where it's not like crushingly humid but I've yeah. got like good photo exposure and, and, you know, there's not that much difference between day and night, man, that's pretty nice. Like that's, that's pretty damn nice for, for me. Like I'm happy. I'm really firing on all cylinders. Things seem really optimized for me in a, a situation like that. Um, but yeah, so I don't the, know. I don't know. Yeah. So those are, for those of us in Northern latitudes, like me in Washington state, um, even though I don't live on the west side of Washington, I live in the eastern Washington, so we get a lot of sun, mm -hmm. um, and you know, especially in the summer. What what is the best way to, you know, to optimize our health, um, you know, to create a diurnal lifestyle in it, the winter, I, especially. It, 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 you know, it, so like being around like Wenatchee or Spokane and stuff like that is kind of cool because it's kind of high desert. Um, yeah. Uh, you, you do, I, I think you guys get north of like 300 days of, of sun per year, yeah, which is do, amazing. Right. Like Kalispell gets like 120 days of sun per year. <laughs> I think it's like jealous, very jealous in, in that regard. But, um, in general, like, and th this applies across the board to the degree that we can get outside early in the day, like as the sun is coming up and I never do this. I so stink at this. Like, I, you know. You're getting the kids going, you're trying to get breakfast, you know, there's usually work obligations. And so I really suck at doing this, but try to get outside somewhere around like uh, uh, 
sunrise or, or, you know, just early and be outside. And honestly, the longer one can be outside throughout the day, the better. Um, getting some amount of sun on our person is really good. There's a great app called D minder, which will take your latitude, your skin type and give you a, a rough idea of how to be out in the sun to optimize vitamin D production and minimize skin damage. And what's interesting is since I've started doing D minder, I took my, my vitamin D levels from probably like forties up to about 70 to 80, which I, I kind of go back and forth on whether or not it, it needs to be that high, but I have very little tan. Now what's interesting is I used to be out in the sun longer than I needed previously. It, whereas now my D minder app, I, I will be out, you know, I'll, I'll be as naked as I can without getting arrested, <laughs> which, you know, maybe like 20 minutes, 30 minutes aside, yeah. depending on the, the time of year. And then I'll put on a hat, long sleeve shirt, but I'll still try to be outside so that the light is going into my eyes. Right. Like this is kind of optimized deal, but definitely getting sun on our skin is beneficial. Um, and then getting a little bit of that evening, uh, the sun is setting like orange light is really good. And then if we need to still be awake after sunset, which at Northern areas, we're going, we're going to need yeah. that, or we're going to bed at like four 30 at night, which is sounds amazing to me, but I, I can't pull that off yet. You <laughs> right, know, right. <laughs> um, I installed dimmer switches throughout all of our rooms in our house. And so in the evening, I just dial the light intensity down. Some people will wear blue blockers. That's, that's fine. It, it's not just the blue light and the red light, but all, it, the light intensity is a big deal too. So if you're wearing blue blockers, but it's like Yankee Stadium, they're 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 better than nothing, but it's still not really right. addressing the the real need. So it it really need ideally kind of span the whole day, but get outside early. Try to be outside as much as you can. Have a safe, reasonable sun exposure as often as you can. Try to get a little bit of evening light. And then once the sun goes down, try to minimize the uh, intensity and the, the mainly the intensity, but also the qualitative nature of the light, like try to make it more like red or orange light in the, in the evening if you can, but you really want to dial the intensity down. And if folks do that, typically their sleep is amazing. Like people just sleep in, incredibly well. And there've been some fascinating studies where they have folks that have uh, completely unremitting, uh, uh, insomnia and we'll take these folks out in the woods and it's basically a tent and a backpack and no electronics and they have a, a campfire people don't have insomnia when they camp yeah. like it, it's gone it, it's gone right. within like a day two days max like the this insomnia that's just been going on and on and i'm not super i'm not as freaked out about like emf and all that stuff as some people are and maybe i'm an idiot for that but i i don't think that it's as big a deal as a lot of other things, but maybe EMF is a problem. I think that people are just constantly ruminating and stimulated in their regular environment, right. you know, the email and social media and all, all that type of stuff. But there've been a, a couple of interesting, good studies where they have folks that have had horrible sleep sometimes for years and they just take them out in the woods and they have a tent, a backpack, you know, a, a sleeping bag, campfire for light and no, no TV, no radio, maybe a book to read. And they do not have sleep issues when they live that way, which is maybe kind of informational in, in, in and of itself, you know? Well, and I can say by doing that myself, I mean, I don't typically have insomnia and I think it's try it's because I try to stay on a circadian rhythm. I try to go to bed at the same time all the time and don't stay up super late, even on, on non-work days and try to get at least eight to nine hours a night. Um, but I will tell you, I, I usually, I, I try to go on an annual hiking trip with my kids. And one of the rules is, is that we, uh, I haven't, we haven't done this in a few years, but one of the rules was, is that we have to get all, all electronics are gone and we can't, right. we can't use our electronics. And of course we're hiking. So we're hiking anyway, where from, you know, 13 to 20 miles a day, which can be a good hike. Well, right. when you stop at camp and then you set up a fire and you make food and then the sun's starting to go down. I mean, you're beat. Yeah, you're done. You're done. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. one of the things that we might, one of the problems I think also is, is, you know, with insomnia 
is that we're not moving enough. I mean, if right. you're not tired at night, maybe you're not moving enough. And I, and I get it. We all have sedentary jobs, but that's, I think that's why it's necessary to, to put some kind of extra movement or exercise yep. into, into our, our day. And speaking of that, when it comes to decision fatigue, and I'm saying I'm guilty of this too, and this is, but this is what I'll tell people, make the decision to exercise earlier in the day. Right, right. Later at right. night, you don't have the opportunity to say no. Right. And, you know, I got up this morning and I worked out before our, our, our interview because uh, I knew later in the day it was going to be easier to say no because you've right. already made a bunch of decisions. And so once you get up in the morning, you exercise um, and, and you just start out a good day like that. Yep. Yep. For sure. For sure. So Rob, as we, as we wrap this podcast up, I, I appreciate your information and I just, um, you know, I'm super excited to just uh, talk to you and chat with you. And I can see how a Joe Rogan interview could go three hours and be and not in, without a problem. I mean, that's for sure, because, uh, you know, if you're both passionate about the subjects and you've got good knowledge and good content, uh, it, it goes it goes super fast. So it does. Yeah. So you kind of wrapped it up about, you know, how to how to look at the you know, how best to, especially in Northern latitudes to, um, live optimal with optimal health with circadian rhythm. So, um, how would you, in the last two minutes, what would you, what would you like to, to sum up to our, our listeners and, and viewers? Man, you, you know, I would just throw this out there. I've been reasonably successful being kind of a, a food oriented guy. And I would be fascinated to, um, if I could do two things, r r turn back time, everybody would love to turn back time, but, uh, and then alternate universe. And I run my career as a sleep guy, not a food guy. And I literally did everything that I I've done in the context of we're going to optimize your sleep because sleep is this non-negotiable thing. You, you would die sooner from not sleeping yeah. than you would eating because you made the point that um, physical activity is important for good sleep and being outside circadian biology is important for good sleep. Gut health and gut microbiome ends up being super important for good sleep and, and like on and on and on. And so everything that I usually talk about regarding health could be couched in sleep. But what would be interesting to, to see is would I have been more or less successful in reaching people if I couched everything in terms of sleep, because if somebody is waking up in the middle of the night because they're getting high and low blood sugar problems, then I can say, well, this is the reason why you're, you're having these problems. We let's try a lower carb diet, but we're doing it in the turn in the context of you're metabolically unhealthy and it's distur disturbing your sleep. And we know that that's a, that's a problem versus I'm the food guy and I'm taking the stuff that you like away, you know? And so we've got a fight and there's the whole, like, well, right. paleo is this weird reenactment deal and all that type of stuff. So I, that would be interesting to me. Like, I think that sleep and circadian biology are so important that, uh, I would make the case that I would probably be more successful and would have probably had more reach being the sleep guy all the way through versus the food guy, because I would have, started off, I think with fewer fights and less drama, like the real type a, like, um, over the top achievers are tough to reach on this. Like the, the CEOs and the corporate execs and all that stuff, they, they definitely have that, that notion of, uh, I'll, I'll sleep when I'm dead, but you can do some really cool little interventions with them where you do like, a. uh, uh manual skill testing, whether it, it's video game type stuff or cognitive and test them when they're well rested versus when they're poorly rested. And we've seen this just with uh, computer programmers that write code. There are these great programs that look at how many lines of code these folks write per, per hour, or per minute, and what their error rate is. And when people are sleep deprived, their, their, their productivity tanks and their, the, the work output tanks and their error rate explodes. And so it becomes this thing where like you're better off to just go to sleep. So that, I guess that's what I would close things up with. Like if people are trying to think about where should they focus, like food's important, movement's important. But if you kind of make sleep yeah. your hub and then do everything else as spokes that support sleep, um, maybe it's easier to get to that point. Maybe it's easier to justify dietary change and exercise and whatnot because it's not 
to get skinny or to do this or do that, or maybe those are, are, you know, side effects. But if we really understand that when I sleep well, I feel amazing and that I'm kind of at my optimum best, uh, maybe it will make it easier to do all the other stuff and stay on top of the sleep. That I mean, that's, that's very powerful. And I, I I'm with you a hundred percent. I I will tell you, I think the more I just learn about it, um, sleep trumps it all. It doesn't matter yeah. how good you eat. It doesn't matter how much you exercise, but we get stronger when we sleep. We don't get stronger when we exercise and food is a part of it to help us get stronger, but we recover and get stronger and not just physically, but mentally too. Um, right. You know, and you just said that. So sleep, sleep trumps it all. And if you think about it, the way we're designed, I mean, we're probably meant to sleep you know, I know as Americans, we only sleep eight to nine hours a day, or we should be, or that's what we're taught. But when you look at traditionally in a hunter and gatherer society, we were probably resting 14, 15 more. hours yeah. a day. I mean, yeah. honestly, you know, I mean, it yeah. was, and it was a lot less stress with um, distractions and things like that. So yeah, For sure. yeah. rest yep. and sleep are very important. So as always, Rob, um, always a always a pleasure to have you on. I, I really appreciate you being on your super wealth of knowledge. Uh, thank you for educating us and educating and empower our, our listeners about how important sleep is. That's that's the goal of our of our uh, a podcast. So I think we've realized that goal. So um, thank you so much, Rob. Always a pleasure. Huge honor. Thank you. Right. So thank you all for listening and tuning in. Thank you so much. 